Welcome to Our Next Existence by Katie and the Chorus. I'm Katie, former technology strategist turned reluctant spiritual medium, and I channel messages from the Chorus, a group of beings just beyond our sensory perceptions who are loving, expansive, and who greatly enjoy sharing their perspective of us. Join us each week as we share and discuss their ideas about humanity's existence, purpose, and future. Concepts you can draw from to accelerate your path, expand your perceptions, and ultimately step into the flow of the universe and your life. Welcome back, everybody. I was just thinking about last week's episode in the channeled portion of the chorus, the second one, the one that's stuck in the audio. (laughs) And I was thinking about when they were describing that the human heart or our connection to this incredible source of power that we had sort of chosen in our course of limitation to obscure our connection to it. And then they said that others had benefited from its obfuscation. I actually hesitated when I said that because I couldn't remember what obfuscate means. (laughs) I said it anyways, like you do. And then I went and I looked it up afterwards. And the definition is to render obscure, unclear, or unintelligible. And I thought, yeah, that sounds right. Don't we have experiences in our reality where you feel like you're following your heart and then it kind of all goes to crap. And then you're not so sure after the fact that you knew what your heart was saying. Another definition of obfuscate is to throw into shadow or darken. Now at the end of book two, In my notes about my conversations with the uh, Federation, there's a paragraph on counter strategies. And one of them was um, manipulating starseed consciousness to avoid, reject, or disconnect from possibility. Specifically, this might look like traumatic experiences which close the heart centers of these individuals. So for more on that, you can check out the back of book two, but I think it's interesting that they're talking about the source of power within humankind comes from what we would call the heart. I think energetically it's much more than the pumping blood organ. It's our source of connection to the energy of infinite creation. It's it's our plug. It's our loudspeaker by their view. The way they said we resonate we translate that energy and and pour it out of us into the universe. And it would seem that perhaps there are races or civilizations out there that somehow benefit from our loudspeakers being dimmed. Now, what do we do about that? (laughs) Well, if we're following the advice of the chorus, we get curious about it. Because the more we understand about more perspectives in the universe, the stronger, more well-rounded, more far-reaching, more robust our perspective becomes. I don't know if this is how it works for every species, but doesn't it kind of make sense for us? I feel like we're all connectors. We are all seekers. We are all understanders. We are all teachers may be hard to say about some of the ones who are asleep, but then also I'm not totally sure anymore who's human and who's not. (laughs) In the first book, the chorus was sort of like, what's a human? You know, they raised the question. And the further I go, the more that question stands out to me. I don't know how to define this anymore. Is it by a certain caliber of heart? Is it about having a thing that we call a heart and some don't? Is it about emotional expression, which has been told to me several times now that that's unique to humankind? Are we the only ones laughing in the universe? Is that our unique expression? Sitting here, cracking ourselves up over how completely ridiculously awful awakening is? (laughs) Ah, And there's so much more to say, so let's get to it. So I'm not messing around this time. I know what's going to happen when I channel. 
it's going to like disappear <laughs> unless I do it last. So I'm going to go record a discussion for a channeled message that hasn't come through yet. And then you go ahead and listen to that channeled message now, and I'll meet you on the back end. In the first part of the episode, you'll hear directly from the chorus and friends, and afterwards we will discuss. Enjoy. Hi. Okay, so it's it's still Katie. I know I'm, I'm breaking my own procedures here on the podcast, but okay. So you see what happened was I just recorded that kickoff and then I went to go do the discussion and then the chorus kind of just showed up in the middle of the discussion. And I kind of get the sense that that's their channeled message today. So, so we're just going to continue with the discussion now. Okay. We love you infinitely. This feels a lot less weird than I thought it would. (laughs) I am about to discuss something that I have not yet channeled. And yet I just feel like I know what this episode's about. I bet you feel it too. I mean, in some ways, we could sit here and talk about anything, and it all falls under the bucket of awakening. So, as the chorus often says, we really can't mess this up. The first thing that comes to mind that I would like to tie into from last week's episode and the episodes this season so far is our growing understanding of time and distance and the interplay of beliefs into our expression and experience of these things. After the black helicopters and after my experience in Chaco Canyon, the world of conspiracy theories, space programs, alien encounters, other channels, all of it opened up like a giant dam, (laughs) just flooded my world. It seemed everyone I was meeting knew so many things that I didn't. It seemed every time I turned around, I stumbled across some new source of information. And all of these things had been hidden or just out of my view through all of the years of my channeling. In fact, at times it was so pervasive that I was really sort of flabbergasted that I hadn't come across any of this stuff in the years before. Now, in some ways, it's understandable because once I started channeling, I really did stop ingesting other information. I think like most of us do when we open up to a new connection and we're evaluating like what's coming out of me versus what's coming in, we sort of need a little bit of a blank slate. We need a clean canvas to put those new colors onto in order to feel like we're really seeing them. So though I had read spiritual books earlier in my life, predominantly just about meditation or Eastern philosophies or intentional manifestation, things like that, I stopped reading all of those things through the early years of channeling. And honestly, if I had a chance to read anything, it was usually about my illness or it was, you know, a complete reality escape. But after these events of the helicopters, well, really starting with the UFO over my house, the helicopters, and then going to Chaco, things were getting progressively more and more real. They were integrating into the fabric of my regular life. So perhaps it's not surprising then that there was this influx of information from my reality or new corners of our reality that I was now starting to branch into and connect into that really sort of kept flowing in to my awareness. One of the areas that I was sort of the most struck by was a total body of whistleblowers, books, and documents that tended to relate to the idea of government programs that had been going on for quite some time, unbeknownst to many of us, 
but that seemed to have access to very, very, very advanced technologies. Technologies that would seem to play with the fundamental engines of our reality that the chorus had spoken about. Prior to this juncture, it never occurred to me that there really could be ways of like physically with our hands holding and manipulating these engines. Sure, as a sci-fi concept, maybe out there somewhere in the future, again, as we often do, we put a, a distance of time between us and those possibilities. Of course, I believed that could be true. But did I believe that it was already happening and potentially had been happening for decades? Not really. It's not that I didn't believe the whistleblower accounts. It was just that I had worked in technology and I had seen overblown claims many, many, many times. I mean, the first time I heard the word algorithm, like, I don't know, decades ago, when I started working on data science teams and doing data analysis, I had to ask like 20 different questions to get down to the fact that it really was just a complicated series of strings of math in a spreadsheet. <laughs> like we throw around this word algorithm all the time, like, oh, the algorithms, like they have a mind of their own. And really you come down to it. It's if then statements, if this, then that, if this, then that. And over and over again, these seemingly complex technologies had a very simple premise underlying many of them. So when I came into this new body of, of evidence or of claims, I had a very strong dose of skepticism given my background. Yes, it's true that we have built extraordinary things, but as soon as a claim starts to feel difficult to understand, I take that sometimes as a reflection of the person's understanding who is making the claim. It's a very famous Mark Twain quote that says, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. Meaning, if I was more sophisticated in my understanding of what it is that I'm trying to tell you, I could probably tell it to you in fewer words. The concept would get more succinct. The explanation would get more clear. The underlying understanding would be very simple. So I tended to find in my career that the most overblown claims often had to do with the newest technologies. Humans tend to do this in the course of coming across something new. We get, we get really excited. <laughs> and in our excitement, we sort of like word vomit all over the place. We're just trying so hard to describe what it is and we're so excited and it seems so big and so grand. And then over time, as it gets integrated into the fabric of what we believe, it becomes a more feeling sensation of the mundane. And maybe it's because it's no longer at that bleeding edge. It's more woven into everything that we believe. So sometimes an overblown claim or a really out there or extraordinary claim feels to me to be new as opposed to be something that is so sophisticated, it's crazy difficult to understand. I don't take those as synonymous right off the bat. Now, have I come across things in my career that were difficult to understand? Of course, but here the definition of difficult would just be, it just required a little more time than some other things did. There maybe were 10 steps to understanding how it functioned instead of just two. And if I had no context for seven of those 10 steps, you factor in a little more time to understand each of those steps. But ultimately, the only difference between you and understanding a thing is time. I understand that for many humans, this is not a common belief, although I do think it's spreading. I have come across many humans in the course of my life who just don't believe that they can understand certain things. It comes down to a question of capability, regardless of how much time that they have. However, there does seem to be an aspect of what they believe about themselves that prevents them from opening up to even trying over a period of time. And I often feel like that's because those topics, if they did open up to them, would show them really key and critical aspects of their larger selves. We can almost find that in all places in our lives especially those of us who've been down the road of awakening a little bit, 
the topics that we had the most resistance to looking at were typically part of the engine that was driving us around limitation. And when we're finally done experiencing those aspects of limitation, we can take what we would say a hard look at, but what the course would say an open and allowing look at that one topic that for years we just couldn't even address or approach. Trauma, broad scale in the human society is one such topic. We have come a long way in allowing as a society the expression or the realization consciously of how we are feeling. And also, there continue to be aspects of things that we have experienced that are coming up for us. These things that we have experienced tend to be events that we classify as trauma because they are classified often as negative, too much at once, and deeply out of our control. Powerlessness is a very strong characteristic of most trauma-based experiences. I think I posted on our Instagram a little while ago some quotes from The Body Keeps the Score, which is an incredible book that I highly recommend. And of the many anecdotes that he shares in the book, one of them is about Pavlov's dogs. Now, most people know the experiments that Pavlov did in Russia on the dogs where he rang the bell before mealtime, and then he could get the dogs to salivate simply by ringing the bell. They were trained. They were programmed into a form of pattern recognition that their bodies responded to. A lesser known story about Pavlov's dogs is that there was a flood and the flood came into the lab and the dogs were all in cages and could not escape. All the dogs survived and they got in and got the dogs out. But afterwards, all the dogs expressed versions of trauma. I'll leave it up to you to read the book and to read about the different ways that dogs and humans respond to trauma. Sometimes we get aggressive. Sometimes we are fawning. Sometimes we completely check out or are scared or, you know, curl up in the cage and refuse to come out. All of these different responses have to do with the different ways that the trauma changes the function of the brain in terms of processing this event. And sometimes the brain gets what we would call stuck in terms of not being able to move the emotion through the body and process what has happened from a frontal lobe perspective. In psychological circles, the phrase is, it got stuck in the reptilian brain, basically the flight, fight, or freeze aspects of us. Anytime that traumatic event is triggered or recalled, we revert into that part of our brains and that response, even though the trauma isn't here anymore. It's just a memory of the trauma. Contrast that with someone who has integrated, as we say, the experience And if there's a similar stimuli in the environment, they can recognize that that reminds them of that event that once happened to them, but is not happening now. PTSD among soldiers is a very common example of this, where if there is a trigger in the environment, the soldier will feel as though they are still back on the battlefield or in whatever traumatic experience it was that was the original cause of the trauma itself. Now, through the months that I was going through my divorce and coming across many of these government programs, I was also simultaneously reading and doing a lot of research on trauma. Because first, I really wanted to understand it from the mental five senses, our society perspective. And then I also kind of wanted to understand what was going on energetically. What would the chorus have to say about trauma? It seemed like a very big topic and not one that I felt like there could be succinct definitions for, but it also seemed like such a big aspect of what was going on with my society at this time. In fact, it seemed like every time I turned around, there was some new trauma that was being uncovered. How had this happened? How was there this layer of hidden society where all of this trauma was occurring that the rest of us didn't even know or that all of us potentially have experienced and most just still forgot? Okay, so we just hit the first crossroads. What is your heart doing right now? And you might be saying, 
wait, what? I thought I thought we were like talking about trauma. I was kind of in the zone. I was just listening to you. That's all great. Just check in with how your heart is feeling about this topic. What's coming up for you? What are you starting to sense? Any emotion? And now which direction do you want to go? And you might say, wait, what? Katie, I'm listening to you. You recorded this podcast at some other point in time. I have no control over what you say. I mean, I guess I could turn the podcast off and go do something else. All true. The five senses will translate the desire to change something into a physical action that is expressed with the five senses body. But I'm not talking to the five senses. I'm talking to your energy and I'm talking to your heart. How does your heart express direction? Or said another way, how does it emanate direction? Okay, so let's keep going with this topic. So I want you to keep track of what your heart feels as I say these next two sentences. It would seem that our planet has been subject to a great deal of trauma over some unknown period of time that many of us are just starting to awaken to and are unsure how to deal with. Okay, how does it feel? Now, I even changed my tone of voice. (laughs) I could have said that in a really happy tone of voice and it would have really messed with the mind and I was being gentle. I'm not messing with the mind today. I'm just speaking to your heart. And you're like, this is a really serious subject. This is like, we need to really figure this out. Yes, it is. What's your heart doing? Maybe you might say that it feels, well, my heart feels heavy. It feels totally overwhelmed. Like it's not sure how it's going to stand up and look at this. Correct. What is that indicating about direction? I'll give you a hint. The chorus alluded to this in last week's episode. That is a sensation in the human format of turning around, away from the future, away from the forward path in which the distance between us and our heart's next desire can be very short. When we turn around and try to look backward again and again and again at what has already happened as a way of resolving it and changing it, our heart feels a heaviness. That heaviness is emanating an energetic aspect of distance. We have been very unconscious to what our hearts are capable of doing for a variety of reasons. And we'll uncover them all in the course of this awakening. But we actually have a power over our reality and how far away or how close things can come. In it being unconscious to us, it has seemed largely out of our control. When we come up to a topic like this and we feel that sense of heaviness, we feel that that is simply our response to a very heavy very sad, very complicated and disturbing topic. If you look at sort of like the Buddhist type of philosophies and a sense of neutrality that can be achieved, ideally, when you approach any of these topics, it isn't necessarily that there are no emotions, although I understand that some Eastern philosophies interpret it that way, but you can't really do away with the energetic interpretation that is inherent in humankind. You're going to feel stuff. The difference comes from whether or not we perceive a topic as emanating something that makes us feel this emotion or the topic is actually being perceivable neutrally and our response from our energy and our resonance emits an emotion that is full of information that is actually telling us about the vaster energies of us and the topic. 
So when your heart responds to something, it is not necessarily that there is a stimulus out there and it made us feel a certain way, although that is a perfectly valid, infinitely valid view from the five senses where we had no effect on the world around us. We just sort of walked through it and were constantly shocked by it. But energetically, you and we all are resonating, vibrating, billions of times per second as we perceive the rest of the universe. Our hearts, according to the chorus in last week's episode, are like navigational compasses. They are journeyers, they are wayfinders, they are connected to creation itself. They're going to show and do a lot of things. One of the things that they offer or that we are capable of doing as we navigate an infinite variety of frequencies is to know where the heck we're going. (laughs) And if you feel a heaviness in your heart, it is because you have sensed a possibility by way of potentially encountering this new thing in the universe, which is an experience of trauma. You are aware of your path of greatest expansion through the universe and the desires that translate from that path into our hearts. And then as we turn backwards to try and get to what it is that we want, we feel a sense of nuanced heaviness. That is our perception of that direction through the energies. Now watch what your heart does in contrast to the turning around and we got to go look at this trauma and we got to figure it out, that kind of sensation. Okay, now... Feel what your heart does as I say these next several sentences, and I'm going to try and keep my voice like really monotone, okay? We're leaving the brain out of this. Thanks, brain. We love you. But you come after energetic resonance, which we're all awakening to. So right now, we're working on the energetic frontiers of what it is that you can feel. Ready? Okay. So let's ask the chorus what they would view trauma as energetically how it participated in our experience of limitation, how we created it, and what we are going to do in the course of becoming conscious to and expanding beyond these aspects of this creation. Okay, there was a lot of words, and I tried to keep my voice pretty monotone. Did you feel any subtle shifts in your heart? These are very small, minor examples intentionally. Now, if you are tracking where I'm tracking, which is hard to do because you all are sprinkled across moments in time in our group consensus, so I'm doing my best. But if you are tracking where I'm tracking, there should have been a very slight and subtle uptick in the lightness in your heart. Like a little bit like, oh. It could feel like a slight uptick in curiosity, like, oh, yeah. I wonder what they would say about that. It could also be substantial, as in like, yeah, I'd way rather talk about that. Okay, that is your heart telling you that you are moving in a forward direction. And we're using linear directional terms, backwards and forwards, understanding that there's an infinite number of ways to look at this in the universe, but they work. They work for humans and they work for where we are right now to express the meaning of a thing. So that lightness means that you have turned forward into new energy and new explanations. You are back in the flow of things. This flow that we often talk about, that we sense when we're like, yeah, we're just cruising and jamming and we're just in it, is a loose way of saying this, but these directions are going to become even more understandable and nuanced and specific in some ways. But essentially, you're turning back in the direction of allowance. Allowance as, I'm going to let this trauma and this understanding be what it is, where it is right now, and now I'm going to allow for new perspectives to come through. Like the course. The uptick in curiosity is our sense of turning in the direction of new energy. And sometimes it's as strong as a very loving sensation, which is allowing, which is a broader opening to allowance of other energies 
that we would perceive here as new or expansive, expansive being another euphemism for maybe that forward direction. Okay, so what does the Course have to say about trauma? Beloved ones, as you are becoming aware of the structure of the soul, you were coming to understand the ways in which you had participated in different aspects of the versions of your history, of your timelines, and your lifetimes, as you call them, across the game board. Your soul is like a fabric that can be moved around, utilized for different things. It has played many parts and many roles across this version of your world and many others. The sense of trauma that you will feel in the early stages of awakening is in some ways a recognition of the aspects of this fabric that you are, that exists, that you hold, that has been fractured in some ways. The connections between the knowledge that you hold in all parts of your soul had been siloed. Okay, I'm going to pause right there. Feel your heart for just a second. Okay, I'm going to keep going with the course. We can understand from the five senses perspective the need to scrutinize and to understand the traumatic experiences that you are now recalling at this juncture in your history. And also, from an energetic standpoint, they are a moment-in-time reflection of the energetic fractures of the soul that you are awakening to. Their natures will change as you continue to reconnect these aspects of yourself. You are, beloved, indestructible. Your connection to the universe, to creation, to life, to infinite healing is infallible and unbreakable through all time. There have been moments when you have been knocked down on the game board and there have been decisions made that have separated these aspects of yourself by way of an extraordinary perspective of separation which you chose to participate in. You do not yet see the entirety of the tale. You do not yet remember what you did before and after those traumatic moments. These memories are being shaped both by the group consensus, by forces that are being exerted in this very dynamic game field, by the beliefs you hold and are becoming conscious to. The powerlessness that is often expressed in these remembrances of trauma at this juncture is not the complete story. It is the first aspect of which that you are awakening to. And as you regain your sense of and then your beliefs of your own power, the reunification of your souls will tell you everything that occurred, the roles you played, the roles others played too. By some views, you are awakening first to the most powerless version of that which you have been, for it is an expression of first remembering that you were once a complete soul and are not yet again. I 
Okay, how about now? I cried. (laughs) I don't know if any of you guys did. It doesn't feel like it in the beginning, does it? Feeling the sadness and feeling the pain and releasing it all. It doesn't feel like power. But then the more we let it roll through us, Once the waves pass, there's brighter light left behind. The heart knows the direction towards this kind of release. It's a soft language. And most often, these kinds of things only show up once we begin to trust our own bodies, our own emotions, our own sensations. Whether it's a a safe space with someone we love, where we finally feel like we can talk about and express these things or just feel them. It's a therapist's office, whether it's the beach, whether it's a journal, whether it's a microphone and some channeled beings. It's the safe spaces we come to where we can finally allow our hearts to feel what they need to feel because they know where we're going. This may be an ungenerous simplification, but typically it is the activity of the five senses mind that wants to turn around and study and examine and categorize and list and look backward. And that is because when we turn our attention backward under the guise of mental scrutiny as a way to understand what we are activating is a limitation by way of a repetition of energies that has already occurred. I mean, trust me, I get it. I came from a tech background where root cause analysis was like a daily meal. (laughs) When something went wrong, he went back and he studied it. It's such a quintessential part of how we operate, how we viewed the universe, how we felt like we prevented further wrongs because it was such an underlying fabric of our experience of limitation. Backwards was the direction that humanity always went. And that's how we became masters of limitation. These cycles that perhaps we're all awakening to, the cycles of destruction, You know, in every circle, there's like a coming out (laughs) and then there's a going back around. We've talked about sort of the cycles of karma and things like that from book one. And this is just another expanded explanation of it. Every time humanity starts to move forward, at some point there is a choice, a decision, an action, an event that causes us to go back. We look backwards at everything that happened, at everything that unfolded, of how it came to be this way. And in so doing, we energize more of the experience of an uncertainty on how to move forward. Remember that ancient language that I talked about hearing in Chaco Canyon a couple episodes ago? They actually have a lot to say about the heart. My interpretation of them are kind of like native warriors. I don't know how else to put it. They feel very connected to the earth and natural elements, sky and wind and water. When I go places with them, they ask for permission before we cross a stream 
they bow down and honor rocks and mountains that I was just sort of absentmindedly walking by <laughs> and don't even realize I was feeling something until they pause me and ask me to say a blessing. One day I was climbing up a very steep rock mountain cliff thing. <laughs> I don't know totally how to describe it, but it was very big. It was very slippery. It was very steep. It was very majestic. And I was in awe over what I was feeling as I was climbing it. And it's getting more and more steep and it's getting more and more dusty and slippery as I get to the top, midway to the top, let's say, before it really just shoots up like a cliff. <laughs> And as I'm getting closer and closer and closer, I feel an urge grow stronger and stronger and stronger inside of me to turn around. I was feeling something and it was terrifying. It was overwhelming. I was convinced I wasn't alone. The energy of this place was very intense. How had they brought me here? I never would have climbed that high without them suggesting that I do. <laughs> My mind was on fire because I was on the brink of an expansion. And when we are at that crossroads, we typically will become most aware of the urges inside of us to turn away from the thing that is most about to open us up to more of what we are. And we will also feel the gentle stirrings and sometimes even burning in our heart that wants this that craves this, that knows this, that is expanding into this. And feeling those two forces at once is quite an experience. So I get to this point in the climb where I'm like slipping and sliding. I'm pretty sure I'm going to need to break out rock climbing gear if I go any further. <laughs> and then that ancient language comes through and very gently stills me in my walk, my frantic walk to find the next foothold and whatever, just stills me. And they very gently bow my head at the shoulders. They have me bow at the shoulders. And then they lift both of my hands together, open palms to the sky. And they greeted someone, someone's, Spirits, ancients, I don't know. In the mountain itself, they thanked the mountain. They asked for permission to be there. They asked for forgiveness for what had occurred. They asked if they could do something there that they knew needed to be done. And I started to tear up as their voice came out of my voice and into that crevice in this giant mountain. Because I realized that they were moving forward with open, incredibly strong hearts that weren't wavering, that weren't questioning, that they didn't know necessarily how it would all turn out but their hearts knew they were in the right place, showing up for the right next thing that needed to be done and feeling their sense of wholeheartedness, feeling their strength. I was able to feel a response from the mountain itself or whoever was there come into my heart. There I was standing on the side of a hiking trail mountain thing the same way I had done for years. And yet I had never felt so much around me, in me, through me, across times, across places. It all felt so connected. And my heart knew the way. And that was the first and probably most incredible thing that I had to learn along the way and in opening into my heart more and more was that it's not, it's not what it is at first, forever. 
at first opening into your heart, you sort of feel these waves of emotion and you find yourself crying or <laughs> it's a lot for a human. And it feels like going in the wrong direction because we have things to do and we can't just like sit here and cry all the time <laughs> and feel these things. But that's, that's like just opening the garden gate. That's just what that motion feels like. It's not what the whole garden is. And in fact, having felt the heart strength of other civilizations, I know with certainty that there's a whole lot more in the heart besides these initial waves of emotion where we are releasing the beliefs that kept us from turning in its direction. The second thing I've learned along the way is that we tend to feel the most alone, or I did, when I was on the cusp of a new energetic connection that I would feel through my entire energetic being, but also, as we would say, through my heart. We feel the most alone before we open up the garden gate and walk through it and connect to all different aspects of nature, of societies, of beings. We won't be alone in our heart. It's just the culmination of realizing how much our hearts had been disconnected through all the busy thinking and actions of limitation that the mind had kept us in each time we approached the gate and turned backward. After having written the second book on time, I was reminded over and over again that miracles can happen in any moment in time. Rapid and low probability manifestation <laughs> can pop into our reality at any point in time. I think sometimes when we look at trauma, we feel like it's going to take forever to deal with, to process, to talk about. And maybe that's because up until now, up until these junctures in awakening, it was very new and new energy took time in our reality. And so we have used that as a basis for the definition of how long it'll take for us to move through these things. But the heart doesn't slog. The heart moves like lightning, especially once you open up to its full potential. And so though at times it may feel like there's trauma everywhere and it's going to take us forever to figure out all of this and heal all of this, and that's true from a certain perspective, from a mind-based perspective that needed to analyze it, list it, categorize it. But also these shaking sensations that many of us are having are only because we are at the gate about to open up to a full sensation of the heart. And yes, there's a bit of a waterfall as we start to turn towards it in these early months early years, however you want to say it. But beyond these moments, there's an entire universe of beings that we will connect with, understand, put things back together with, build with, have fun with. So if you are lucky enough <laughs> to feel your heart again, if there's something that sneaks in, maybe in these messages, and causes the pangs, the openings, the burnings, the sensations, just remember that sometimes those rumblings are just the thunder that can come before the lightning. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you found these messages to be helpful. May they accelerate you on your path wherever you'd like it to go. For more information on the books which correspond to these podcast seasons, our podcast, live events, or how to get in touch with us, visit katieandthechorus.com. Thanks again. See you next time.